Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our, I guess this will be our last real Grand Rounds. Um, next week, we do have our residence kit, but this will be the, the last Grand Rounds um, formal prior to uh, the winter break. Um, and uh, with much demand, we have uh, exciting rounds for you today, basically um, just covering things that I know are very relevant for those of uh, us that have tuned in. Um, in terms of what's to come over the holiday period. So before I introduce the speakers and move forward, I just wanted to share um, what's going on across the zone as uh, we've been uh, doing uh, over the past few days, few weeks. So um, once again, this is our, our website. You can uh, access it directly from the, the right-hand side there on our home, home site. Um, on the website, there's various tabs that you can work through. Most of what's going to be covered today is under the medicine pandemic plan. Um, it's been up uh, a lot, sorry, <laughs> a lot of that information has been uploaded. Obviously, you'll need your CCID for that. Um, so just, just uh, uh, sort of play around with it. I'm just going to share the current numbers, starting with the early warning system. So just putting this up for our um, inpatient bed forecast, you can see that we've seen a significant um, uh, slope sort of uh, uh, steepening um, and, uh, and, and with the numbers over the past couple of weeks. And so um, we're optimistic that with some of the measures that were brought in a few days ago um, that will go uh, live on Sunday, that we, are, we hopefully should be able to have a little bit of an impact on this curve. But you can see that Christmas Day, um, if you look down here, those are sort of the numbers that are projected. And so um, based on that, obviously, um, that's going to affect our hospitalizations. Um, so currently in the Edmonton zone, you can see that uh, we've uh, got approximately, uh, this, this isn't necessarily up to date for today, but at least within the last 24 hours, 383 uh, patients in the Edmonton zone. Um, the vast majority at the Royal Alec and the university site, um, you can see them here. And, uh, and then the Grey Nuns is close behind and uh, followed by the Misericordia and the Sturgeon. Um, I will say that a lot of uh, these cases may be on an outbreak unit um, and not necessarily on uh, the, the COVID ward, particularly at the Royal Alex site, as I mentioned last week. Um, the Royal Alex site is on watch. And so um, there is a sort of a mixed uh, bag in terms of the reporting. Um, but nonetheless, that this is a significant number of inpatients that is going to test us over the coming weeks, given what's to come. Having said all of that, um, we do have some good news on the horizon. As you've heard, um, there is a vaccine that will be coming shortly, starting next week. Um, so far, the news we've gotten with the vaccine is priority will be given to those who are on the front lines and exposed to um, aerosolized generating procedures. So particularly our respiratory therapists and our critical care staff and, and those on the COVID ward. We don't have all the details yet, but uh, we know that it'll be across four sites in, in Alberta, um, two in the Edmonton zone, the Royal Alec and the university site. Um, and really that, that has to do with testing the stability of the vaccine and, and being able to, to provide the vaccine um, at the site that it's being delivered at. So, you know, there is, there is a rollout strategy that, that is uh, being planned. And so that's, that's a big positive. Um, the second positive is that the government did announce the new measures um, going forward starting Sunday. And so we're hoping and optimistic that that will have a, a positive impact in terms of the numbers. And then lastly, I will tell you what, what inspires me and keeps me going is, is our faculty. You know, we, we all know that uh, this is not going to be uh, managed on the shoulders of one or two areas. And so I have been so heartened by every um, everybody sort of chipping in, um, identifying where they can help, how they can support. 
um, and, uh, you know, just doing whatever needs to be done to make this happen. Um, and so to that end, um, we wanted to have these rounds to at least begin that supporting period of uh, identifying sort of what are some of the tips and tricks of, of uh, running the COVID ward, um, what do you need to know, um, and really then focusing on spending some time uh, answering any of your questions because uh, um, it's very understandable if you haven't looked after inpatients for a while, it can be anxiety provoking. So to that end, without further ado, we'll get started. I'm just going to briefly introduce our speakers and panelists today. So um, first of all, we have Dr. Katie Collins, who is from the Division of General Internal Medicine. She is a clinical lecturer. She's done most of her training with us. In fact, Katie, I think I've written most of your, your uh, reference letters throughout, from student to resident to wherever. Um, Katie's an outstanding clinician and I'm uh, and newly minted, I guess, general internal medicine specialists um, and uh, has, has gotten a lot of experience on the COVID ward in the short time that, that we've been uh, doing this. And then next we have Dr. Shannon Ip, um, who is an associate clinical uh, professor. Um, Shannon is an outstanding clinician, always, you know, sort of ready to step up, the, our go-to person in terms of, of uh, uh, knowing how to, how to deal with, you know, common sense issues and things. And so um, I'm really happy that Katie and Shannon agreed to do this. And then next we have Dr. Wendy Slegal. Um, so Wendy, as you most of you know, is a professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine here, and she's got an adjunct appointment in the Department of Medicine within the Division of Infectious Diseases, as well as in the School of Public Health. Um, while her clinical practice is predominantly in critical care, she does also continue to do some infectious diseases, um, general and transplant. Um, and she's been involved, many of you know, in, in, uh, in a, a number of the COVID uh, research studies and obviously providing support to those of us on the medicine wards um, while she's on, on uh, critical care service. I should also mention that both Shannon and Wendy are on service right now, so they may get called away. So just be prepared. Um, and then lastly, I'm delighted to, um, to introduce Dr. Nisha Bakshi. Many of you have probably heard from her in various venues. She's been leading the, the charge at the Royal Alex site. She's a general internist and associate clinical professor, um, has gotten a ton of experience in looking after COVID patients in, in the short time that, um, that she's been dealing with this at the Royal Alec has really been a leader there in terms of, of, uh, of putting together re the response on the inpatient medicine ward. Um, I can honestly tell you that um, the reason uh, I am so excited about this panelist is if I get COVID, I want one of these four looking after me. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Katie. Thank you so much, Dr. Kassam. Um, we're all really honored to be part of the panel today. And um, Shannon and I, um, have had some experience on the COVID ward uh, more recently. And so we're hoping to share some of our experiences with you today. And then Dr. Wendy Slegal, um, as Dr. Kassam mentioned, will be chatting about um, ICU involvement. And we're really fortunate to have Dr. Bakshi here as well to share some of her experiences from the rural Alex. So we are hoping to cover today um, a bit of an overview of the overall Department of Medicine uh, COVID pandemic plan. We'll review some of the tips and tricks from uh, the ward itself, so PPE, the daily process that goes on, um, as well as a little bit on the um, sort of flow of patients uh, within uh, the hospital from the emergency department to the COVID ward, and then a little bit on our overall experience. So this is just to review um, our U of A medicine COVID ward coverage. And Dr. Kassam actually came up with this back in February. And of course, there's been some tweaks and changes along the way, but we've stuck pretty close to the plan. So initially, when uh, we had very few patients, our first designated COVID ward was 5D4, which is well underway now and has uh, um, become a full COVID ward one. Um, we have gone to stage two, where uh, the second ward was 5S3, which is being covered by family medicine and pulmonary right now. 
Um, stage three then was 5D3, which is now underway as well. And family medicine and general internal medicine is covering that. And this week we have progressed to stage four, where we have started uh, failing COVID patients up in 5D2. Nephrology has started on that ward. Dr. Bronco Brom uh, from Nephrology Division has shadowed me this week and Dr. Hildebrandt has already started looking after patients. And this morning they have already uh, sent a patient to the ICU. Um, next, uh, we uh, will progress to stage five, where the plan is to open 3D3, where geriatrics and GI um, is um, the plan for them to cover that ward. And then the next stage uh, six will possibly be 3D4, and I think that's still in the works and it's uh, very fluid, but I think the plan is for cardiology, heme, and ID to uh, cover those services. And there's plans for extra wards and stages as we get more patients potentially. So we'll talk a little bit about the COVID ward uh, and principles. So this is just uh, the first ward that opened up uh, 5D4 as a COVID ward. And this was done uh, largely under the lead, I believe, of Dr. Stephanie Smith and the administrative panel. Um, but uh, this is a map of 5D4 where there's a clear entrance um, and the 5D foyer. Uh, which is now a dawning uh, station for actually all three wards, 5D2, 3, and 4. And there is a dawning coach or a PPE coach to help you don to get into the ward. The hallways uh, are glove-free zones, so you don't go in with gloves. And uh, the back room and the nursing station, there's no gloves either. And it's just to prevent you from having a false sense of security that you're sterile with your gloves on or clean with your gloves on. Um, uh, so you'll see these glove-free zones uh, signs marked on the floor and up top on doors and overhead. Uh, on the floor, you'll also see these uh, signs of donning areas and doffing areas to go into patients' rooms and exit patients' rooms. In 5D4, there's a separate exit that exits into the 5E area. And so every ward is going to be slightly different, but at the exit of 5D4, there is a, another PPE coach, which will help you to exit uh, the unit properly. And they will help you out. So we just wanted to touch a little bit um, on PPE. And this is an excellent video um, that features Dr. Stephanie Smith uh, in reviewing the donning and doffing um, process. Um, I would highly recommend watching this video before um, entering one of the COVID wards because uh, she goes over a lot of important uh, tips and tricks for that. So as uh, Shannon mentioned, there will be a PPE coach um, at the front of the units to actually assist you with donning um, your PPE. So the first step is to sort of put on your gown. And then the type of masking that we have um, at the um, entrance depends on what's going on um, on the ward at any given time. So it'll either be a surgical mask with uh, eye protection or continuous N95 with eye protection. Um, so when I was on the ward recently, um, we did switch to using continuous N95 for a period of time, given how many patients were actually on OptiFlow at the time. Um, there are also um, some shortages of some of the N95 mask sizes. So just a brief reminder here uh, to make sure that your N95 fit testing is uh, up to date. There's an area at the front as well, and of course the coaches will guide you on that, where you can actually put your phone, your pager, or whatever else you uh, think you might need on the ward into a plastic bag. Um, you can keep your list out in a pen as well, um, if you feel that it's needed. And once you enter the ward, you'll have on your gown and uh, your face PPE, and you'll enter without gloves like Shannon mentioned, and you can put all of uh, your items into either the back room or at the nursing station. So you will be wearing continuous um, PPE while um, on the ward and gloves are worn um, for all patient encounters and then exchanged um, between each patient. Now the area where it gets a little bit trickier is when we're switching um, our surgical mask and um, eye protection on the unit. So let's say um, there's not as many patients uh, on OptiFlow at one time. Um, and you're wearing a regular surgical mask and eye protection. At that point, whenever you go into a room with an AGMP, such as OptiFlow, you'll be required to switch um, your mask to an N95. So once you're removing the eye protection and removing your surgical mask, um, don't forget to wash your hands in between each step. And then when you reapply the N95 and um, face shields um, or um, whatever sort of eye protection, then you'll be safe to um, enter the room. In terms of um, exchanging your um, other types of PPE, so the gown um, as well as um, any type of mask or face shield, um, this depends really um, if you're entering anything 
patient room that's on a contact precaution, so MRSA, ESBL, or C. diff, uh, for example, um, you'll have to change your gown in between those patients. Otherwise, you would keep your gown on continuously throughout the unit. Um, and then you can exchange your gown, mask, or shields, uh, whatever you need to, if anything becomes soiled or wet. And this is just a little um, reminder here just to not uh, touch your face. So at the exit of the unit uh, is where you'll be doffing uh, your PPE. And again, there should be a, a coach there to assist you with that. Um, this can be a, a point where it's a potential risk for contaminating yourself. So it's really great to have the coaches there to assist you. Uh, there is a dirty bucket where you can put all of your items that you had um, onto the ward. And once you've doffed your PPE, cleaned your hands in between um, each step, there is um, cleaning solution and wipes as well as some cloths where you can actually clean all of your things before um, exiting the ward. So how will your daily um, process work on the wards? So uh, the, you will be on your own. The MRP will be on your own. There are no CAs or residents or learners um, on these wards during the day. Um, there are pharmacists, I believe, still on most wards, but that uh, may change. Um, so you can pre-round if you like. And then there are rapid rounds uh, between 8.10 to 8.30 in the back room or you can join via Skype or Zoom where you run through all your patients on the ward with the allied healthcare team members. So the unit manager, the charge nurse, PT, OT, all that. And primarily discussing the discharges, the ongoings of the patients, whether patients can come off isolation. Uh, things are still running on these wards, uh, typically in normal fashion. So labs are still being done. We just ask that uh, you try to order labs once a day, just so the lab technician can just make their rounds once a day and uh, not needing to come back multiple times. Diagnostic imaging is still being done. Um, and so patients are going to x-rays or ultrasounds or CTs, whatever they may need to be done. If you need portable x-rays, they, uh, they will come up to the ward to get whatever x-ray, chest x-ray that needs to be done. If you need inter any interventions, you can call the POCUS team to come up to help you with any procedure, bedside procedures that need to be done. Again, uh, the, the admin uh, or the uh, team that has looked after this from high above have arranged for extra nursing staff on these wards. So it's quite well staffed. They've arranged for protocols for how is food service is going to run through the ward, how are porters going to go through the ward, all that. And there are also extra housekeeping staff allocated to these units to keep the wards nice and clean. So, um, uh, how you manage your practice or practice pattern is up to you, but typically we, once we drop off the pager and phone into the back room, uh, most of us have found that just for flow reasons, it's just easier to start seeing your patients around. And then once you're done, go back to the back room and then you can check all your messages, your investigations, all that. And then after that, we do highly recommend that you make daily calls or as much as possible to patients' families, as you know, they don't have much contact with the patients in hospital. Uh, there are portable phones, iPads, laptops for patients to um, do FaceTime or call uh, the family members in uh, the hospital. As you probably know, um, there's uh, the visitation policy on these COVID wars or there are absolutely no visitors. The only exception is for end of life, uh, for C1 goals of care or for those that you think are imminently passing away and those cases are regardless of their goals of care. Um, so overnight coverage is, um, so for, um, right now that's in flex and still being debated a little bit, but um, right now most of the wards do have clinical associate or CA coverage. Um, and then we're as the wards grow or the number of patients increase, we're trying to have staff fill in uh, to be in-house uh, under the pandemic ARP. And Dr. Frala Morales, if you've received her email, she's frantically trying to find people uh, to help with that at night. Um, you know, most of our patients are deteriorating usually in the middle of the night. And so this is scary for our CAs. And so you will be called about your patients overnight uh, by them or the ICU or whoever. So in terms of how do patients get admitted or transferred onto the COVID ward, currently general internal medicine is triaging all the COVID positive patients. And Dr. Morales came up with this phrase that COVID trumps all. So regardless if they've had a hip fracture, they're on dialysis, whatever, we are taking all COVID positive patients to these COVID wards. The only exception is for patients that are uh, requiring card extra cardiac care under cardiology and the ICU, of course. 
Um, for patients that come through the emergency department, the general internal medicine emergency consult physician will triage all these patients. For internal transfers, so transfer between services like family medicine or nephrology, for example, or ICU, uh, during the daytime, eight to five, page the general internal medicine ward consults a physician on call and they will triage uh, the calls. And then after hours between 5 p.m. to 8 in the morning, call the general internal medicine on call attending. For external transfers from other sites, uh, just like usual, they would be called to us via rapid and it would be to the general internal medicine physician on call. There is an algorithm uh, for uh, the Edmonton zone as to how to handle this and how to triage this on the Department of Medicine website. So who actually gets um, transferred over to the COVID ward? Um, so it's actually meeting these uh, three criteria. So we do ask um, if you are calling um, the general internal medicine team to accept this patient that they do meet these criteria. So the first being, um, of course, uh, having a COVID swab positive and still requiring isolation. So it's great to check with IPC first because they'll be able to guide you on whether or not uh, they still need to remain isolated. Um, not requiring telemetry and not requiring um, intensive care. This is just a screenshot from um, Connect Care to help you in finding um, where the patients are actually hiding on the list. So um, over on the left-hand side here, you can see under available lists, um, EDM, WMC, U of A Hospital. Um, you can find uh, provider teams there. And right now they're labeled as COVID Ward 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you can actually drag them up um, to your list, so I have mine just under GIM service patients um, right now. And we do ask um, that the MRP keep the list up to date, just so that um, the other uh, members of faculty and whatnot can actually see um, where the patients are and how many COVID patients we have on each unit. So who are we actually admitting to um, the COVID wards? It's really still um, case by case and um, after the emergency physician and uh, internal medicine team has assessed. We do, um, are, we are really seeing, especially in the second week after symptom onset, uh, significant deterioration, hypoxia in those patients, um, especially in older adults and those with uh, significant comorbidities. If the patient's hypoxic, um, so usually less than 92% on room air at rest or a greater than 3% uh, desaturation on uh, road test. Some other reasons that we're seeing um, patients get admitted is overall generalized weakness, especially in our elderly patients um, who are having quite a bit of difficulty coping at home with this, um, and other things like uh, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and significant uh, electrolyte abnormalities. So this is just a figure taken from uh, Nejum. Um, but the interesting thing is that there's a, a very, a, quite a long incubation period. So where uh, patients uh, sometimes uh, take up to three to five days to manifest symptoms. And then once they develop symptoms is often, again, as Katie mentioned, the second week before they develop their shortness of breath, dyspnea, and the ARDS. So it's long, it's a very, very long period of the whole trajectory. So just keep that in mind. This is a patient that I thought was really interesting. Jordan's husband actually showed me this screenshot at uh, Instagram um, uh, with this patient that was on the news, Ricky Lam, 40 years old uh, male, where he documented his trajectory very well on Instagram. And unfortunately, he passed away. So as you can see on the bottom black box, at the, on November 20th, he was in the emergency because his breathing had suddenly got worse. He didn't know he had COVID yet. And then up above in the gray box, uh, unfortunately, uh, because he was on room air, he didn't need oxygen, he was sent home. And then on November 23rd, uh, in the top left corner, he documents that his breathing has become very difficult and he's having coughing fits. And then unfortunately, by November 24th, he passed away. And so these are, you know, one of the many unfortunate stories that we're hearing. And so, um, you know, one of the difficulties we're having in terms of who to admit, who, do, uh, who should we keep, um, uh, we've got some um, prognostication scores. Yeah, so um, in addition to uh, the usual investigations, our basic blood work, chest x-rays, um, there are some additional laboratory investigations being done, um, often in the emergency department. And it is difficult to sometimes know how to interpret these things, especially in the setting of acute illness, but things like D-dimer, CRP, elevated uh, ferritin have been shown to be associated with more severe co uh, courses of COVID-19, um, as well as um, we are seeing quite a bit of lymphopenia uh, on the CBC diff. 
Um, in doing a bit of a literature review, there's um, quite a few different scoring systems. And so this is not um, to highlight any one in particular that you can use, um, but there are uh, ones like this one, the 4C mortality score, um, which we were using um, up on the unit to um, give us a sense of who might be at higher risk of more severe disease um, or even death. So will gloss over management a bit uh, quickly, as you know, things are always changing and the evidence is uh, not fully there. But uh, the main thing uh, is try to establish goals of care early on in mission as much as you can with the patients and families because we know that these patients are deteriorating quickly. And as time goes on, of course, we assess this. Um, so at the end of the day, supportive care is the main thing and is oxygen. And so the literature varies, but most uh, studies suggest to target the oxygen saturation between 92 to 96 percent. Many patients uh, require high flow oxygen or OptiFlow very quickly, and this is definitely available on wards. Just remember to wear your N95 if this is the case. Uh, there is no availability of NIPPB or uh, BiPAP right now on the wards. If you think that these people need this or more aggressive care, um, and I'm sure Dr. Sliga will talk about this, but uh, consider consulting the ICU. So one of the things that we've seen in the literature is self-proning or tummy time. So if any of your patients are hypoxic, um, it is recommended to have them self-prone as much as they can, as much as they tolerate for one to two hours at a time. Dexamethasone, I, th I think you guys all know early on there was conflicting evidence, but since then there's been a NEGM article that suggests that dexamethasone does help in hospitalized patients. So the uh, treatment that used in this paper was six milligrams daily, so PO or IV for 10 days or until discharge, whichever is sooner. So uh, for patients require supplemental oxygen, uh, you can see the figure uh, underneath where invasive uh, mechanical ventilation patients dexamethasone was shown to be better by up to 11.7% absolute reduction in mortality. Uh, for those requiring oxygen, there was also some benefit shown with dexamethasone at 3.5%. And just keep in mind that for patients that did not require oxygen, uh, there was actually a 3.8% increase in mortality. So uh, we suggest to not use dexamethasone in patients that do not require oxygen. Um, and we do tend to stop it once the patients are off oxygen or discharged. Uh, just keep in mind, most of your patients have obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Those are the three I think we see the most often with these patients. And so once you start dexamethasone, their sugars will go high. So you will need to uh, adjust your insulin a bit. Antibiotics is also um, uh, quite debatable. But in general, if you think that your patients have a secondary superimposed bacterial pneumonia, you can consider empiric antibiotics. Many people are aspirating afterward, afterwards. Uh, so again, can consider antibiotics. Um, this is a screenshot of the guidance paper um, uh, that's also available on the Department of Medicine website, uh, written by, uh, uh, including uh, Dr. Lenora Saxinger. And so this is on the website for you to view. Some of the other treatments that have been um, hotly debated and um, being looked at, uh, especially in major trials, is things like anticoagulation. So um, we know there is a significant increased risk of VTE in COVID patients, um, especially in the ICU, and some studies actually showing even up to 30%. Um, so DVT prophylaxis is recommended for um, all of our patients unless uh, contraindicated. Um, if you think that the, um, your patient is high risk or having features that seem out of keeping with just COVID pneumonia, um, if they're stable enough, you could consider a CTPE scan. Um, however, more uh, data is actually needed to determine whether or not we would be doing intermediate dose prophylaxis or um, full dose anticoagulation. And this is actually... Um, variable depending on uh, the site, especially in the US, there's quite a few protocols that actually go through which patients would get um, intermediate dose prophylaxis, prophylaxis or even uh, empiric full dose anticoagulation. Um, remdesivir is uh, still in the works of being looked at, but uh, and it was only available um, on the basis of research trials. Uh, just a little tidbit, on November 19th, WHO updated their living guideline that they uh, suggest against remdesivir for hospitalized patients. Research. So um, I think there are lots of research trials ongoing. Um, and so they're, uh, they're trying to coordinate this, but currently 
uh, we are being asked as MRPs to ask our patients whether they would be interested in even being approached by a research coroner. And if they are, um, just give their names to the research coordinator. And I think they are largely led by Dr. Uh, Sligo and Dr. Ritchie. Um, if they do need investigations uh, done for research purposes, they're trying to coordinate this uh, with the morning daily labs that are being drawn. So um, as you uh, probably can guess, there is a lot of ICU involvement with these patients. Uh, interestingly, many patients look very well, even though they're on 100% OptiFlow. Um, and so we collaborate uh, very much with ICU. I just called uh, Dr. Myers on two patients this morning. Just make sure that goals of care are one to R3. And then at this point in time, we'll ask Dr. Sligo to talk about her, percept her perspective from the ICU. Okay, I wanna thank Katie and Shannon for inviting me to speak. Um, and over the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm gonna take you through um, a few objectives that I was specifically asked to address. So. The first one, I just need to give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on in the ICU to give you that context. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, some of the risk factors for ICU admission, and I'll talk about the local situation at the U, uh, at the U of A. Uh, I'm gonna discuss when and how to involve ICU, and then I'm gonna go over MET and code uh, processes very briefly. Uh, so just to go over again the quick numbers, I know Norman had already given us a bit of a brief on this, but as you know, uh, we're seeing increasing cases in the province with over 20,000 active cases, almost 10,000 in, uh, in the Edmonton zone, and we have 124 um, ICU patients currently, and that is uh, out of a bed base that used to be around 250 beds, so almost half of our ICU beds now uh, are being uh, uh, used for COVID positive patients. Um, and as you can see, unfortunately, many of these cases, this is uh, a graph showing the new uh, hospitalization uh, cases and Edmonton zone is uh, leading uh, in this area, unfortunately. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is both non-ICU and ICU hospitalizations and steep curves upwards. Again, as Norman mentioned, hopefully some of the uh, restrictions that have been put in place will help bend these curves. But unfortunately, the next couple of months are looking like they're going to be very busy for all of us. Uh, and Norman showed you the early, early warning system, the forecast for hospitalized patients. This is the similar graph for ICU. Uh, and yesterday's numbers were 124. And as you can see, uh, there's high, medium, and low predictions. Uh, and unfortunately, if we're looking at the high uh, graph, we're looking at almost 200 ICU patients over the next couple of weeks. And this graph just shows you the um, ICU COVID positive admissions uh, compared to our total ICU admissions. And as you can see, prior to uh, COVID, we had, you know, we were almost always at 100% capacity. We had uh, waxing and waning of our numbers. Uh, but you can see this orange graph is the percentage or the proportion of patients that are COVID positive. And you can see it's just increased dramatically over the last couple of months and is taking up a large chunk of our ICU bed base. In terms of average age for COVID cases, as you know, the ones that are non-hospitalized tend, tend to be younger. So the average age is 36 years. Those that are hospitalized are 62 years uh, and ICU the 60 years, so slightly younger than uh, all hospitalized patients. And these are national numbers. Uh, and then of the patients that are dying from COVID, the average age is 82 years. So in terms of risk factors of who ends up uh, coming to hospital, coming to ICU and dying, you can see uh, age is a very strong risk factor, which has already been mentioned. Uh, and as you can see with uh, an increase in age by, by decade, you can see increasing uh, hospitalizations and similarly an increase in ICU admissions with advanced age. It does drop off as you can see in the 70 to 79 and 80 uh, plus cohorts. And that's likely patient preferences as well as uh, some of these patients may not necessarily benefit from ICU and so therefore uh, do not come to the ICU. Uh, and to the far right, you can see many of the deaths have been uh, in the elderly, again, in the 70 uh, and 80 plus uh, age cohorts. The other strong risk factor for hospitalization and for ICU admission particularly is, uh, is comorbidity. So as you can see on the far right, these are the patients that don't uh, develop severe disease and are generally can recover at home. Uh, in the green, you can see no comorbidities. Uh, gray is one comorbidity, 
blue is two and the pink is three or more. And so very few patients have a high comorbid disease burden that stay at home. Once you get into the hospitalized patients, both non-ICU and ICU, we're seeing almost a third of patients uh, or more than a third of patients with three or more uh, comorbidities. And of those that are dying, a large proportion uh, have a significant comorbid disease burden. So just to give you an idea of, uh, of what's happening in terms of hospitalized patients, approximately a fifth to a quarter are coming to us in the ICU. Um, so when we look at your ward numbers, we're in our heads doing the math and thinking about how many patients we're going to have to accommodate. Um, of the patients that come to ICU in Canada, we're seeing approximately a quarter of those patients ending up on ventilators. Um, at the U of A, we're seeing higher rates than that. I don't have an exact number for you, but it's about 50% or more. And I think that's because you guys are doing such a wonderful job on the ward and are actually accommodating quite high acuity patients in that you are offering OptiFlow, whereas many of those patients in other centers may end up having to come to the ICU. Um, so we are seeing a higher proportion of patients require mechanical ventilation. This is uh, just shows us again, the lay of the land in terms of the U of A hospital. And we see, um, again, those numbers seem to fit. I think we have uh, 17 on 5D4, 17 on 5F4, uh, 16 on 5D3 and 17 in the ICU. So that one in uh, four approximately of patients requiring uh, ICU support. Okay, so what you guys all wanna know is when do you involve ICU? Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the principles of ICU decision making. Uh, and I think the number one principle is collegiality. So we really do need to work together. And I think to date, it's uh, everyone's been so wonderful in terms of communicating and collaborating and, and doing our absolute best to make sure patients receive the best care. I think it's also very important uh, to respect patient wishes. And so having an understanding of what their expectations are, what their values and morals are, and what they... Uh, what they would like in terms of if there's any limits in terms of what we should be providing is important to outline ahead of time. We'll talk about goals of care de a designation in the next few slides. Understanding the patient's previous conditions, so again, those comorbidities, how frail are they, knowing their age, knowing their comorbid com conditions and how they were functioning in the community prior to coming into hospital are really important for us to know in the ICU. And then obviously their current condition, how sick are they, how urgently do they need uh, to come to the ICU. And lastly, I just wanted to point out, uh, it's important that we have a commitment to providing care for all. There are patients that we will see that we decide to either withhold or withdraw um, therapies. And in those situations, we still obviously, we always provide care. Uh, and we are also happy to help you with uh, end of life uh, and comfort measures if that is needed. So reasons not to admit to the ICU, uh, first and foremost, refusal by patient or family. If they do not want ICU level uh, care, then obviously uh, we would not admit them. Um, if a higher level of care can be still provided safely outside the ICU, and like I mentioned, many patients are receiving OptiFlow on the COVID wards, uh, and, and it is safe to do that um, in, in, as a case-by-case -case basis. And as we get tighter and tighter for ICU beds, we may uh, again see more patients that we're trying to manage safely on the ward. And then patients that wouldn't benefit, these patients obviously shouldn't be admitted, in particular if we think admission to ICU will only artificially and transiently maintain their life at the expense of their suffering and not change the eventual outcome. So who to admit to ICU? The criteria are not strictly defined. I'm sure you all want me to give you black and white numbers, call us when this, this, or this, and I will give you some of those, um, but identification of patients who benefit from our services sometimes can be difficult, uh, and obviously demand for ICU beds exceeds the supply, so um, we do need to keep all these things in mind, and so it's a case-by-case -case decision in terms of who does come to the ICU. Goals of care designation is extremely important to have documented on every patient. And in general, we're going to be seeing mostly the you know, R1, R2, and R3 patients. These are patients that want uh, resuscitative interventions. So R1 are the ones that there are no limits. So they would get CPR in the event of cardiac arrest, intubation, mechanical ventilation, and ICU level support. R2 patients are those that do not want chest compressions, but would receive intubation, mechanical ventilation, and other uh, ICU level supports. And R3 are those that don't want intubation, uh, don't want CPR in the event of cardiac arrest, and they also do not want intubation. They can still be admitted to the ICU for non-invasive mechanical ventilation, 
for vasopressors, for intensive monitoring and intensive nursing care. Uh, so again, we will see all those patients. For the M Ms and the Cs, so M is medical care and C is comfort care. These patients in general are not thought to benefit from ICU. However, we're happy again to see these patients and provide uh, support uh, or a device if you need us to. So these priori prioritization models I took from the Society of Critical Care Medicine, uh, which is the uh, ICU body in the US, just to give you an idea of which patients we prioritize in the ICU. So the number one priority are critically ill unstable patients where they can't receive care anywhere else except the ICU. In particular, things like ventilators, continuous vasoactive infusions, uh, mechanical circulatory support, they would go to CVICU if they required ECMO. And they're patients that generally don't have any limits on their therapy and have a high likelihood of benefiting from ICU level care. Priority two patients require intensive monitoring. They may potentially uh, need immediate intervention. Generally, they don't have any therapeutic limits and they may have some chronic comorbidities and acute severe illness. Priority three patients are generally critically ill, have reduced likelihood of recovery. They have severe underlying comorbid diseases, but also severe acute illness. And we may place some limits uh, to their therapies, again, such as no intubation, no CPR, uh, depending on patient's preferences. And again, the likelihood that we think they'll benefit from these therapies. And then lastly, priority four, these patients generally are unlikely to benefit from ICU. They're either too well or they're too sick, um, but we do admit these patients on an individual basis in unusual or exceptional circumstances. So uh, Norman already mentioned briefly early warning scores or early warning systems. Uh, we have some modeling to help us predict which patients might get sick on a, on a sort of uh, community level, but there's also things we can do in the individual patient to identify which ones may require ICU level support. So uh, on the ward, each of these patients, I think every shift are getting a modified early warning score, the MUSE score. This is a composite score of their vital signs and clinical parameters, and we can see changes over time. And the hope is that we can identify patients early, uh, and so we can intervene and avoid failure to rescue. And so this is the MUSE score in EPIC or Connect Care, and it basically, again, is a scoring system looking at respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, urine output, and level of consciousness. And the nurses are uh, should be calculating MUSE scores every shift. And then based on their score, we can categorize them into stable, the watcher category, uh, medium risk for deterioration, or the unstable um, category. And I pulled this off of Connect Care last night. I took all the identifiable information off, but uh, the MET physician has access to a list in Connect Care of all COVID positive hospitalized patients. And we screen this, this list. And so this list has uh, obviously the name of the patient, where they're, they're attending physician, where they're located. And we can see their FiO2 or oxygen flow rates. Um, we can see their goals of care and we can see their MUSE score. And so we can get a better idea of what's going on on the COVID ward and maybe plan accordingly. If we're seeing a whole bunch of patients that are R1s with high MUSE scores, then we may come by the unit more often, touch base with you as the attending physician more often, um, and, and again, be planning for perhaps an influx of patients. And then I just wanted to quickly go over the MET uh, criteria, which have not changed at all. Um, the ones that you're going to mostly be calling us for uh, are the respiratory uh, uh, decompensation criteria. So respiratory rate of greater than 36. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of patients with low respiratory rates. Um, oxygen saturations of less than 90 on 10 liters or on greater than 50% OptiFlow, any sudden deterioration or rapid increase in oxygen requirements. So some patients come in and they do rapidly decompensate. So they might be on one or two liters and a couple of hours later, they're on 10 liters. Those patients you should be letting us know about because that trajectory suggests if it continues, they will probably need ICU admission uh, plus or minus intubation fairly shortly. And then distressed breathing or increased work of breathing is very important. Um, as mentioned, uh, lots of patients on the ward are quite hypoxic. They look quite comfortable. They don't have increased work of breathing uh, and they can compensate for some time. But once they start to have increased work of breathing, we should be aware of those patients. 
So how to get a hold of us, always best to communicate directly. So call us, page us to discuss cases. The Met physician is available during the day and often is doing follow-ups on the COVID ward. And so we'll try to touch base with the attendings, um, talk about who you're worried about. Um, after five o'clock, we obviously have, it's just the on-call intensivist. And um, we do have a system in place where we may have uh, two intensivists in-house as numbers increase, including an, an in-house intensivist. So uh, probably as numbers increase, you'll be seeing us more often. Um, touch base daily if possible. So if you are on the COVID ward, talk to the Met physician. Again, tell them who you're worried about and, and we'll help as best we can. Connect Care Secure Chats are wonderful, uh, although we have had some instances where people are Connect Care chatting us about unstable patients. Uh, I would avoid using that as a communication uh, strategy because we don't always check them in real time. And uh, again, direct communication is better in particular if you're very worried about the patient or it's urgent. And then activate MET or CODE team as needed. Um, so I was asked to, to, to address, you know, what is the process for MET calls and code calls on the COVID ward? And just to be very simple, it's exactly the same. It hasn't changed, except that we are all wearing PPE. Um, so patient care should not change just because they have COVID. And again, our processes haven't significantly changed. Uh, I think being aware of patients early it is helpful because we really do want to avoid emergent intubations on the ward. Uh, and so hopefully we'll be seeing very few codes uh, and uh, some met calls but ideally we're hearing about these patients very early and are having less met or code calls than uh, on no, non-covid uh, wards so again let us know if you have patients that you're worried about um, we will still need your help so having the attending team present for met and code calls is extremely valuable we often don't know these patients we're meeting them for the first time in a very high stress um, high anxiety situation. We're trying to make decisions about appropriateness of care. And so having you there to understand the patient's history and their trajectory is very important to us. And we should be making collaborative decisions. You know the patients much better than we do. And so again, having you present, at least at the beginning, is very helpful to us. We may also call on your team, not you specifically, but your team to perhaps do, CP, you know, do CPR, do chest compressions. Uh, your nurses may help us with IV starts if we're actively resuscitating a patient. And we may ask you to call the family because, again, you probably know them a lot better than we do. Uh, and so uh, your help would be much appreciated during these times. And just lastly, to give you an idea of our ICU capacity, at the U of A, our ICU uh, usually has between 30 and 32 funded beds. Um, we are currently funded for 42 at this stage, although additional beds are being added um, every few days. We're currently have taken over most of the burn unit to increase our bed base, and we are doing uh, cohorting within the ICU with double bunking many patients, um, where we're having two patients per room. So uh, where we're going to move to next still, I know there's lots of very smart people planning this and we'll, uh, we'll get beds released as we need them. CVICU has been wonderful and they've helped to decant patients. They have anywhere up to about 10 COVID patients over in CVICU that they take from us to help us make space. And as I mentioned, ICU capacity will increase as the demand increases. So in terms of my take home points for ICU, we are here to help. Please call us if you're worried, if you need our help. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure patients get the care they need and that you get the support that you need. There are no hard and fast rules, but I would say anyone on 10 liters or more of oxygen probably let us know about them. If they're on OptiFlow and they're exceeding 50 or 60% FiO2, let us know if they have rapid increases in their oxygen requirements. And in particular, if they have increased work of breathing, please call us. Um, ensure all your patients have goals of care so that when we screen that list, we can see what people's goals of care are uh, and there aren't any missing, uh, missing designations in those columns. And then again, lastly, communication and collaboration are essential and we look forward to working with you over the next couple of months. I know it's gonna be really busy, but I think if we all stick together, again, we can continue to provide excellent patient care. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Slegel. Um, so next we wanted to just uh, review some of the principles for transferring patients off of the COVID ward and for discharging. So we are seeing an average length of stay of about 14 days for uh, COVID patients on the wards. And that's mainly from um, a combination of deconditioning, uh, management of comorbidities, as well as kind of the slow wean um, of oxygen. 
Um, if a patient's admission will be um, prolonged beyond their isolation period, um, IPNC has been great in helping us figure out when to actually discontinue that. And I'll go over um, some of the criteria for discontinuing isolation on the next slide. And we got this information from uh, Dr. Stephanie Smith that uh, sort of helps us decide, um, you know, who might be appropriate for uh, discontinuing isolation. So most of the data suggests that the highest risk for transmission of the disease is 24 hours before symptom onset and 48 hours after, and that the viral load tends to decline uh, quickly thereafter. Just to give you a little bit of context as to um, why someone's isolation might be discontinued. So the general criteria for discontinuing isolation, uh, this is still on a case-by-case -case basis as discussed with IP and C but generally about 14 days after uh, symptom onset. This can be longer, up to 21 days uh, for those who are critically ill in the ICU or uh, for immunocompromised patients. They also have to be afebrile for at least 48 hours and have improvement or resolving um, acute respiratory symptoms. This becomes a little bit trickier, uh, especially when looking at patients who are still quite symptomatic or having high oxygen needs. Um, for example, our patients on OptiFlow. And so it'd be important uh, to definitely discuss with IPNC before discontinuing isolation in those cases. And should someone's isolation be discontinued, um, we do ask that they be uh, transferred back to their original service uh, where they're initially admitted. Uh, in this case, we just put nephrology here as an example. So this information can actually be found on Connect Care, um, on the storyboard on the left-hand panel. If you hover your mouse over this um, IPC alert that indicates that the patient has COVID-19, um, it actually gives these criteria here. Um, and you can see this patient uh, should be isolated at least until December 16th. So discharging a patient uh, from the ward uh, itself. So um, certainly up to the MRP when it's felt to be medically appropriate, there's no need for any repeat uh, or negative swabs. Um, the nursing team and the unit clerk have been really excellent in um, calling IPC and confirming how long the patient actually needs to isolate for um, once they're discharged in the community. There's a few responsibilities that we have. So there is a checklist that, again, the nursing staff and unit clerk will help you um, complete. But mainly, it just um, indicates that we are responsible for notifying the patient's uh, primary care physician, should they have one, as well as um, ensuring that the patient can safely isolate uh, at home, um, especially with uh, their own bathroom away from their family members. It's also our responsibility to uh, notify the medical uh, officer of health, as well as the CDC, and the unit clerk and nursing staff will assist you with that process. So um, transportation is managed by the unit clerk and is quite finicky at times because these patients oftentimes are still requiring isolation and there's no way to get them home uh, because no taxi services or uh, Uber driver will take them. So uh, either um, someone drops off a car for them so that the patient can drive themselves home or sometimes you'll just need uh, paramedics to take these patients home. If they are from another facility, uh, such as long-term care, you still need to fill out a risk assessment form to have MOH clear them for a transfer back to their facility. On discharge, if they have pulmonary involvement, which most patients will have, uh, we suggest referral to the pulmonary COVID follow-up clinic uh, run by Dr. Demand and Dr. Uh, Ferrara. And um, these uh, referrals can be done through Connect Care. And of course, educate your patient to return to the hospital if they have new or worsening symptoms. So just a few considerations um, and something that actually came up on one of my weeks on the COVID ward as well is um, when a patient with no fixed address is actually ready for discharge, um, there is the Edmonton isolation facility um, where they can be uh, safely isolated there um, to actually complete their entire isolation period. They're provided with um, housing and meals there. Now, um, in the unfortunate case when a patient is unwilling to go to the Edmonton isolation facility um, or uh, threatening to leave against medical advice, um, there is a Section 44 under the uh, Public Health Act that can be enacted. Um, the information can be found on um, the Insight website. And if you search isolation order package, there's actually an area for attending physicians to click and it provides you with all the links and information to complete um, these forms. So just a few um, final remarks that we wanted to uh, make today. So um, we have received a lot of questions about um, higher risk for us to actually become infected with COVID potentially by working on the COVID units. 
And I did some research and found um, a few studies. And again, it's it's definitely very variable in terms of what um, they've seen, but it has shown that uh, frontline healthcare workers can be um, up to you know a threefold risk uh, increase of uh, contracting COVID nineteen. Um, and it actually seems for healthcare workers working with COVID patients that the greatest risk may actually be our own colleagues or patients that haven't been identified um, as um, COVID yet. Um, fortunately, I think we're really lucky here at our site and um, we have great um, nursing staff and the PPE coaches, which are really helping to keep everything as safe as possible. Having said that, um, I know Shannon and I have been talking a lot about our experiences on the COVID ward and it has been um, incredibly uh, rewarding for both of us. Um, you have a lot of close uh, interactions with not only the patients, but the families as well, um, especially um, trying to contact them over video or Skype um, each day and really uh, sharing how the patient themselves are doing. And it has been an overall really rewarding um, experience. And so these are some of the pictures that Shannon took from 5G4 um, this week that still Allied Health are around and everybody's still um, maintaining a positive um, thinking so far. So uh, just quickly, um, some resources as uh, uh, Norman mentioned there's a Department of Medicine website with her pretty face on there and then just click the medicine pandemic plan for most of these uh, this information where most of it is linked as well um, for us uh, GIM we have a GIM policy website for which COVID has uh, uh, predominantly taken over but we are trying to update the COVID uh, updates uh, for the ward processes uh, regularly as well and that's it uh, I think this is uh, how not to wear your PPE but uh, 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 we're welcome for questions. You just need the sangrias, right? <laughs> um, I will just add to what's already been said. I had the, the honor, actually, of attending on the COVID unit this past weekend. And I cannot um, just tell you enough the, the morale and the positivity there, starting with our PPE coaches um, at Dawning. I mean, I had a little little part of my wrist showing at one point where, you know, right away I was, I was advised I had to cover it up. And they are outstanding. They, they, they're very knowledgeable. They um, are friendly and really willing to help. Uh, the nurses are outstanding. They're their overall attitude is just, let's do what we need to do for these patients. And then finally, the patients, the patients and families are so grateful. Um, you know, they recognize what the sacrifices that you are all making, and they are so grateful for the care they're getting. And it was absolutely an honor to do this. And I'm looking forward to doing it again in, in uh, over the Christmas break. So I would like to start with the first um, little question that I, I thought would come up, but didn't, um, and that's related to our patients being in studies. And it just so happens that Wendy is actually leading that, uh, um, that initiative. So obviously we've got a number of COVID positive patients and a number of uh, studies underway. Um, so Wendy, maybe I, I will just ask you to touch on that. Um, I should also just mention that we have prolonged the rounds for this morning and we're recording everything. So if you have to leave, this will be available on tape as well. So Wendy, I'll let you take it from there. Thanks for that question, Norman. Yeah, I think I think it's wonderful that we have lots of researchers uh, wanting to to do studies in COVID patients and help advance our knowledge. But we've found over the last few months that it's there's a lot of different research teams and the patients and the staff, you know, can be overwhelmed by being approached by so many different teams. And so over the last couple of weeks, we worked very hard with Lawrence Richet, the NAC track and the university and the faculty, you know, to centralize the process. So what you'll be seeing over the next we've already started but what you'll be seeing over the next couple of weeks as we get rolling we have a central coordinator her name is Brianne Stewart she's wonderful um, and she's been working with 5d4 and is going to be working through the same process on other wards and essentially all we need from you as the attendings will need the unit clerk to identify the new patients every day and let you go and you'll know who your new patients are and then we'll ask you to approach them as Shannon mentioned just to get verbal consent there's nothing written to say can we approach you know are you interested in research uh, can we screen your chart to see if you're eligible for research studies and if you are can we can we come talk to you uh, and then just provide that list of the patients that have consented to be approached for research to your unit clerk 
and then we will talk to Lynn or whoever the unit clerk is on, whichever ward it is, uh, and then we can call them and go through, uh, sort of provide them a menu of different types of, if there's trials they're interested in, observational studies, basic science studies, and that, that way they're only being approached by one coordinator. Uh, and then from there, again, you probably don't need to know all the details, but that same quarter co coordinator may be actually doing the full informed consent, or we may be referring them on to another coordinator, depending on how, how labor intensive the study is. But I hope this will help. Uh, we also are going to try to coordinate all lab draws, uh, as Shannon mentioned, with routine lab draws. So just one time that there are lab staff on the unit, other than obviously stat labs that you'll need. Um, to streamline everything and make sure that we are not overwhelming the staff and the patients. Let us let me know how things are going. We are always willing to improve the process and I would welcome your feedback to try to make this as successful as possible as you roll it out. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I, I actually elevated uh, Stephanie Smith to uh, panelist status. I don't know if she's still on the line, but Stephanie, I wonder if you can address the issue. First of all, if you could comment on um, the setup of the COVID wards, if, if you know we covered that appropriately. And there was a question around why we're not changing gowns between patients and why we're considering the unit as a dirty unit. Right, so can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I think that, I mean, in terms of the setup of the COVID unit, um, I'm not sure if you, what specifically you wanted me to comment on, but I do think that um, we've had some observers go and look at uh, 5D4, 5F3, and um, 5D3 just to see how, how the flow is working and everything. And I think, you know, 5D4 having been the first one that's uh, become a full COVID unit is actually working really, really well. I mean, I think that um, the observers when they were there said it was amazing in terms of everyone working together really well. And um, I think that, you know, everyone is, is supporting each other. And um, I think the way that the PPE is used is, is safe. Um, so I think we really, and I think the other two units are using the same model. Um, they're, I think, just a little bit behind in terms of their training. And so we just need to, we need to do a little bit of fine tuning on those wards just to kind of get everyone up to speed. Um, but overall, I do think it's working well. Um, so, you know, the whole rationale of basically putting your PPE on before you actually walk in the door is that we have to consider basically the whole unit is being potentially contaminated just because of the volume of COVID patients that are on the ward. Um, and the fact that, you know, there's, although yes, they're in their rooms, um, you know, they may be sitting in chairs that are close to the door, et cetera. Um, so we do have to kind of consider that the whole unit is contaminated. So basically you're putting your PPE on to protect yourself um, as soon as you like, before you even get in the door. Um, in terms of the gowns, so we really wanted to try to minimize the number of times that you have to take off your PPE and put it back on because those are times when there's a, the potential for contamination or self-contamination. So what we have recommended is that yes, you can use your gown and you don't have to change your gown um, unless there's a couple of situations where you would want to. So number one, obviously, if you have gone into a room uh, with the patient that has MRSA or C. diff or those kinds of things, or if you are going to be um, in a situation where you might get your gown quite contaminated. So, you know, we, one of the situations that um, was brought up to me was, you know, a, a LPN or a nursing aide might help uh, a patient uh, go to the bathroom and they are, you know, they need a lot of assistance and that kind of thing. Um, and then you're helping them in bed, you're doing dressing changes, those kinds of things. Those would be situations where I would say you should probably change out your gown um, just because you're going to have a fair amount of contamination uh, potentially with COVID on your gown. Um, and then you're going to go out and you could contaminate the, you know, the spaces outside of the room that way. So uh, those would be situations where you change your gown out or obviously if it gets visibly contaminated, then you should. Um, but otherwise, you can leave it on. Um, and again, just trying to minimize the number of times you're having to change out your, your PPE. Hope that answers the question. 
I think so. I think that's great. That's exactly what we were looking for. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to bring in Dr. Bakshi now because um, obviously she's got a lot of experience at the Royal Alec where there are some major differences in the sense that um, they don't have connect care. <laughs> they're still using paper charts um, and the room setups are a little bit different. So Nisha, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to just comment on any differences at the Royal Alec site. And also if you could comment on the number of patients you're looking after in any one room. Thanks, Norman. Um, yeah, so our units are a bit different. Um, we have, our wards are all either uh, semi-privates, privates. privates. Um, there, on a few occasions on our wards, we do have four bedrooms as well. Um, we are currently at the Alex into three full wards um, with a kind of a fourth mixed unit. Um, and each of our wards can take approximately anywhere from 28 to 30 patients. Um, this is not inclusive. We've got a bit of a, a outbreak situation at the Royal Alex with a lot of wards on outbreak. And so we've gone to a model where patients who test positive on an outbreak unit are just staying put on that unit since we're not admitting new patients onto that unit. So um, in, a, in a sense, we have five COVID teams plus a sixth, which is a regular medicine team looking after the COVID patients on the outbreak. Um, and we are, we are actually unfortunately not cohorted into one location like it sounds like uh, you guys are at the university. So we have three wards in our active treatment center, which is the same location as the ICU. And we have one ward um, in the Robbins Pavilion, uh, 5 East because of uh, the amount of uh, space they have and the proximity to our cardiac monitor room. Um, we are utilizing our cardiac monitor beds quite frequently, um, primarily for patients who have concurrent high oxygen demands and cardiac arrhythmias, uh, particularly the M1s. So the really sick M1s are going to our cardiac units. Um, on a very, very limited case by case, we are also doing NIV on um, our COVID patients, but it's very, very rare. Um, so if it's concomitant hypercarbia or CHF, but there's a, a clear discussion with pulmonary as well as goals of care discussion prior to us doing that. Um, and then I think what's probably a little different uh, at the Royal Alex as compared to the other sites, you alluded a little bit to the Public Health Act, uh, is that we have a significant number of patients that uh, fall under the Public Health Act. So uh, we are averaging anywhere from 10 to 15 of those patients. And these are patients who are COVID positive uh, and refusing to isolate. So we, this past week, we have actually cohorted them all into one ward um, because oftentimes we need protective services for these patients. Thanks, Deja. I'll come back to that. I know Wendy has to uh, run off, so I want to catch Wendy before she runs. Um, Wendy, just two questions that have come up for you. Number one, is there a role for bronchoscopy? And I think just on a, a broader basis, um, would you mind commenting on your experience with, you know, early on um, invasive ventilation to to sort of the the um, uh, philosophy now where we're trying to be as conservative as possible and your thoughts on that and, and the literature to, to support that. And secondly, there's a lot of questions about um, outcomes in terms of patients that do go to ICU. Um, you know, is there some, some sort of um, information that you have that you can share with the group to help with goals of care discussion in terms of how patients do when they do end up going to ICU? Of course, so the first question about bronchoscopy, I mean, I think early on when we didn't have a good idea of outcomes and transmission or there was a lot, you know, a lot of questions, we were quite conservative and, um, you know, we're avoiding, trying to avoid OptiFlow, intubating early, avoiding any kind of non-invasive ventilation, avoiding bronchoscopy. I think um, the philosophy has changed. And I feel strongly, I know many of my colleagues feel strongly that patients, again, deserve the same care that they uh, would have if, they're, if they didn't have COVID. And so we have PPE, we protect ourselves. If a patient needs a bronchoscopy, I will do a bronchoscopy. Um, I think the one thing with bronchs is that many of these patients aren't requiring bronchs. They don't, we have quite low rates of bacterial superinfection, so that they don't need a lot of pulmonary toileting. They don't have really thick copious secretions. Um, and so we're not doing a lot of bronchs simply because we don't need them. But if we do, if a patient needs a bronch, absolutely, we will provide that service uh, with PPE on, obviously. And same with trachs. I think early on we were waiting quite a long time to do trachs uh, and that uh, philosophy has changed. If a patient needs a trach, then we just go ahead and do it. Um, uh, we don't usually trach patients until they've been on a vent for a couple of weeks. So again, after 14 days, uh, there probably isn't any viable virus anyway, and we are still protecting ourselves though when doing the trachs. Um, 
in terms of outcomes in ICU, it's hard to, I would say, if I could ballpark a number for you, approximately 25% mortality. Uh, and as I mentioned, as I showed in those slides, really the risk factors for, for high mortality are advanced age. So the older the patients are, the more likely they are to die and the higher the comorbid disease burden. Um, so those patients that have many medical, pre-existing medical problems um, are more likely uh, to die in the ICU. And so good self uh, pre-selection. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Katie, I'm gonna ask you about the 4C mortality score. How much are you guys using it? Um, do you think, uh, are you using it to predict and help with regards to um, calling ICU, you know, outside of those parameters that Wendy already measured? Um, how useful is it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of different um, mortality scoring systems um, that are out there. And it was actually uh, Dr. Tim Chan from our division that um, first kind of showed me this 4C mortality score. And I know um, he and I have both been um, using the score in addition to the MUSE score that actually populates on Connect Care that we can see. So interestingly, you know, with the score, the 4C mortality score, it actually um, encompasses a few different things. I think the main thing that it really shows is that these patients with a high number of comorbidities, like Dr. Sligo mentioned, are at higher risk of decompensation and requiring ICU. I did find it helpful to use in patients who are in that goals of care R1 to R3 to say who might be at higher risk of mortality, um, who we should be watching a little bit um, more closely. Now, I don't think it can be used solely to say, okay, your mortality, it does give you a percentage, you know, your mortality is 65%. Um, but I think it's just more of an additional tool that can be helpful. I'm curious um, if Dr. Bakshi as well is using um, any of these types of scores at the Alex or um, any other predictive models that have been out there. Uh, no, we're not actually using any scoring. Um, I think to be, to be quite frank, actually, we're noticing that patients um, typically on day two or day three, who when they're quite stable or when, when we're seeing them decompensate. Um, and I think that the, the amount of uh, patients that we've seen in the last week, week and a half that have decompensated quickly, probably would, we probably could go back and say, if we calculated a score, could we have predicted any of these? Um, but no, we're not using any formal score. Thanks, Nisha. I think Shannon might have had to drop off. Um, she's on the COVID unit. So, um, and, and this one, Nisha, I'm going to throw back at you. Um, how much are you involving palliative care, um, ethics consultation, spiritual care, sort of those other services that we have access to, given that, you know, um, people coming in have to don and doff? Um, and, and how are you using them? Is there, you know, sort of a capacity for virtual care and things? Yeah, so we're not, I don't think we've actually used palliative care too much. I mean, I think when we're palliating these patients, unfortunately, it's quite quick. Um, and so we don't really have the time to involve and have a formal palliative care consult. Uh, I don't think uh, for my colleagues and myself, we've really had any really difficult um, goals of care conversations where families have been resistant. And I think that speaks to the point of having these conversations early on in the stay to identify if things were to go wrong, how do we manage it? Um, but we are using spiritual care frequently. Um, currently they are coming to the ward, um, but if it's on a weekend or evening, we do have ability to do FaceTime with them as well. Um, so that we are using spiritual care kind of more after the comfort care has been uh, decided, um, but no formal palliative consults that we've been doing. I imagine we could if we needed to, but um, like I said, usually we're having those conversations on our own. Um, Wendy, I'm going to throw this at you or, or Stephanie, actually. I know we've had Robin Harrison sort of come and talk about um, healthcare workers and, um, you know, the risk to healthcare workers um, in terms of working on COVID units. And of course, Katie uh, touched on that a little bit. Um, can you just comment a little bit? There, there are a few questions here related to um, what is a reasonable number of days or nights to work consecutively? What is a mi minimum number of days off in between work weeks and so on? Um, I, I, you know, I think this applies equally to ICU as it does to inpatient medicine. So I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts and, and then I'll, I'll ask anyone else who wants to jump in. So 
so I guess I, I'm not sure that I can uh, necessarily answer the question of, you know, who, I mean, how long you can work on a ward. Um, I, I think there are, you know, <laughs> there are limits to how long we should work for safety reasons and that kind of thing. And obviously, you know, on a unit like a COVID unit, um, then it's even, I think, harder because you really do have to pay attention to what you're doing and, and really be careful about self-contamination. So I can tell you that, um, and I think at the Royal Alec, this is true as well, that both at the Royal Alec and at the U, we have had um, healthcare worker uh, infections on our COVID units. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that's led us to do all these fairly intensive observations on the units to really try to figure out what's going on. Because when uh, workplace health and safety interviews uh, the healthcare workers that have been infected, then the information we get back is that there's no breaches in PPE um, on the unit and there's also no significant community. Uh, contacts usually or community risks and so then we're left with well what's going on um, and what we have seen again is that I think you know 5d4 has been in the game a little bit longer and they really have their processes very well streamlined and we really didn't see any issues but on some of the other units where you have First of all, we have lots of float staff and we have new staff um, then it does you know it really, um, I think does make a difference in terms of having being very, very careful about your um, hand hygiene and especially when you're outside of the patient room. So I think that generally people are quite careful in the patient rooms, but I think again, you have to think about the whole unit as being potentially contaminated. Um, and so you have to be very, very careful outside the room as well. Um, and that's, again, why you're wearing all of your PPE. But, you know, what we see is that people are going and touching the wows and then touching, you know, adjusting their um, facial protection and not cleaning their hands. And so um, I do think that because of that and because you have to be so laser focused, um, then it does mean that you know your ability to work for long long hours is probably reduced to a certain extent um, and when we see when we look at who is acquiring COVID um, on the units it does tend to be the staff that are there for 12-hour shifts so it's mostly the nursing staff um, that are the ones that are getting it and I do think it speaks to that whole issue of I mean they certainly have much higher or longer duration of exposure, um, which you know may lead to more chance of inadvertent um, inadvertent exposures. I think the, um, though the question around um, you know needing to take a few days off from face-to-face uh, -face work, I don't think that 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 is something that's recommended. No, we would all agree with that. Yeah, right? I mean, I don't. There's no you know what we expect is that you know people uh, wear their PPE properly and um, do their symptom screening, and certainly if they don't feel that there's been any breaches um, and they feel well, then they can go from working on the COVID unit to their regular duties. Um, and really only if obviously they develop symptoms, then we would be concerned or if they felt that they actually had a breach of their PPE on the unit. Um, those would be the situations where we would say you have to be uh, self isolated. Do you want to comment on is it MLB uh, the the as for outbreak units, the screening that you guys are doing? Uh, yeah, I don't this, know if it's this at all Rob sites. Bob, I think it's yeah, called, Bob. they call themselves. Um, so yeah, this is something that um, has been organized by the site command post here, which has been awesome. Um, and basically it has allowed, so for our COVID units that, or for any of our units on outbreak where there's been healthcare workers affected, um, then the swab mob has um, arranged to do asymptomatic testing of all healthcare workers on those units. So that includes physicians, nurses, allied health, et cetera. Um, and they are basically going twice a day to the um, outside the units uh, where that have been affected uh, by COVID transmission. Um, and so they'll capture the night staff and the day staff. And they, um, the recommendation right now for outbreak and for the COVID units where they've had healthcare worker transmission is to be testing every five days. Thank you. Wendy, do you want to add to any of that? Uh, no, I think, I mean, I think Stephanie covered it very well. I do think uh, Stephanie did comment earlier on in terms of 
telling people how long they can work, how many nights in a row, that really depends on, again, how busy it is. And I think we all need to be very cognizant that it is a stressful environment, both on the COVID ward and in the ICU, and we need to make sure that we're looking after ourselves um, so that we can continue to provide patient care. So I know, so in the ICU, we do a week at a time, but we're now, again, trying to provide some relief with the night person um, so that we can actually get some sleep because the days are just so much busier um, and the night person is doing two or three nights in a row and that's it because it's exhausting. And, you know, I think that's a really important comment in terms of um, our department. You know, if we all just chip in and lend a hand, I think, you know, we can spread the load across. And of course, you get comfortable as you do more, right? So rather than counting on the individuals that have stepped up and, and, and doing a lot more, we, we all just need to chip in, um, count on each other for support, but lend a hand for sure. Um, so I'm going to uh, just switch uh, to a different topic uh, now. I think there's there's a few more questions about specifics related to the Public Health Act. And so um, maybe I'll start off with uh, Nisha. If you can just go step by step, what happens when you have a patient who is non-compliant and you need to enact uh, the Public Health Act? Thanks, Norman. So there's there's kind of two pathways. I think probably the, the main pathway for the university would be the ones that our patients who are already admitted um, who are trying to leave AMA. There is a whole other process for patients who are coming uh, from the community who have been apprehended by um, Section 39. Um, but I think that those are primarily coming to the Royal Alex. So I'll speak to what happens in hospital. Um, so if a patient who is confirmed COVID positive um, tries to leave AMA or does escape and leave AMA, um, the, the first step would be for the MRP to fill out a section 44. And so a section 44 essentially states uh, that the patient is COVID positive and is refusing to isolate and it, it allows protective services uh, to go in and find the patient and bring them back. Um, you only need one signature on that form and it can be any physician. It doesn't have to be a facility medical director or it doesn't have to be a division lead. It can be the MRP. Um, and then there is a notification of rights that come along with the um, section 44 that have to be told to the patient um, that uh, it can is usually found uh, with the 44 to talk about um, why they need to isolate uh, and it's just so that they are aware of that. Um, typically at our site, and I imagine it would be the same at the university, uh, at that point operations would be notified that uh, a patient has left AMA and that a section 44 has been filled out. Uh, and then there's a discussion amongst uh, operations, the physician uh, and the unit to determine A is the unit that where they're on, the, the appropriate unit for them to be on, um, what uh, services are going to be required to help uh, the patient comply and stay. So at the Royal Alex, uh, it would be protective services, uh, plus or minus our arch addictions teams, if that's uh, uh, applicable. Um, and then we typically are also involving the MOH at this point. So the MOH is on the call. We have a huddle call that we, we do on a daily basis for these patients. The MOH is aware um, and we kind of come up with a game plan for when uh, are these patients' isolations complete. So for recalcitrant patients or the patients that are uh, unwilling to stay and are now under Section 44, we are using uh, 10 days, um, but that is a, a soft 10 days. It's, at 10 days, we still have to have a discussion with the MOH and IPNC uh, to ensure that A, if there's any symptoms they've resolved, and B, do we feel that uh, the isolation period is over. Uh, during that 10 days, if the patient uh, st states that they want to comply, uh, we're, we're typically not removing the section 44 unless we have really good um, kind of feeling that this patient will comply or they have a place to isolate. Um, and then at the time when the isolation period is done and we've determined that they're no longer infectious, uh, we fill out section 46. So section 46 does have to be filled out by two physicians. It can be any two physicians. So typically the MRP and then somebody else that's on the COVID ward uh, indicating that the patient is no longer infectious. Uh, after that is completed, the section 46, and then we have a template letter that we use at the Royal Alex that goes to the patient. Uh, all of that is then emailed to the MOH and our operations. So it's a fairly paperwork intensive process. Um, and, and really, it, for the vast majority of these patients are usually not symptomatic. Um, we've had a few that are, but majority of them are asymptomatic. So Katie's just going to show us where to find that form and, and what it looks like. 
Oh yeah, I'll just share my screen here. Um, so how to actually find it is, um, this is just insight.ahs.ca. Um, if you go to the very top here and click um, the latest updates. And then when I was speaking to the MOH on call who I needed to uh, get their assistance in actually filling this out, you scroll all the way down to the bottom in the COVID section, type in isolation. And then when you scroll down, it's this isolation order package and it's actually the very first um, link. So if you click on this one, um, there's a document that will pop up and it gives you know quite a bit of good information on um, what this is all about, first of all. And then down here, which will be most relevant for most of us is um, the process for the uh, attending physician. So it sort of walks um, you through how to actually go about uh, doing this. And if you click here, um, you can download the form that we were showing that um, Dr. Bakshi was also um, speaking about. Hopefully that answers um, any questions. And again, uh, you know, I'll come back to this at the end, but there, you know, for those who have, who aren't on, well, even for those of us who are on the COVID ward, um, you know, we, we ask each other for help, right? So um, this is something that we, we, we can all help each other out with when it comes up. I just have a very um, quick question for the panel, actually, related to um, the, the selection, and this is not just for COVID-specific patients, but related to the MOH forms that we're having to fill out for patients going back to uh, continuing care facilities that are on outbreak, where they ask the attending physician to commit whether or not we're comfortable with them going back or not. Um, since Shannon's come back and joined us, Shannon, I'm gonna start with you. So um, how, do you, how do you fill that out? Like, what do you say? That, um, that there's uh, something in the chat box about how strong the, the, quest, the, the, the questions are about, you know, that you have to feel comfortable, that um, you're, you're almost taking liability for the patient developing COVID when they go back to their continuing care site. How have you approached that? So, um... I would say that everyone's appropriate to return back to their facility, so maybe I'm not uh, the right person to ask, but uh, just keep in mind that, you know, if they don't need to be in a hospital with our scarce resources, we probably try to utilize our resources as best as possible. And just keep in mind that it's right now, it's probably taking seven to 14 days for them to even return home. So actually I'm filling these forms out early uh, because it's just not a quick process at all. Nisha, do you have an opinion about that? Uh, yeah, similar to Shannon. I mean, I think there's risk either way. There's risk of outbreak at the hospital and there's risk of outbreak at their site. So um, knowing that we need the hospital beds and we're doing the same thing. We're trying to fill these out within 24 hours of admission if we can. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the big point is that there is risk. We've had patients get uh, COVID infection in hospital. So I think that you can feel comfortable that if they're going home, uh, going back to their continuing care care facility, that, um, you know, their risk of, of having getting COVID in the acute care facility is probably equal. Um, all right, so we are going to just step back and I'm going to ask, um, since Shannon is back, um, Shannon, tell us about a typical day on the COVID unit. Are, do you stay on the unit? Do you go back to your office to do your charting? Um, what does a, a seven to five day look like on when you're on the COVID unit? And I guess 5D4 would be the best example because we're looking after the highest number of patients there. So, yeah, so this will probably um, depend on your practice pattern. And I actually asked Dr. Smith, uh, Stephanie Smith the same question initially when I first started. But again, I drop off on my staff, uh, like pen, pager, and uh, phone in the back. And so if I'm not answering your messages or, you know, if I haven't seen someone's labs, that's why I'm like seeing the patients first. And, and so it just, you know, you round on the bedside and, you know, from room to room. And if you need to make some notes, you can always go to the back room or the nursing station where your sheets are. But um, probably the recommendation is just to round. Um, uh, one of the recommendations I was given was uh, you're going to be wearing that yellow polyester gown the whole day. So just maybe dress light underneath. So not you're not like so hot because you will be in there and then you have the N95 and the face shield and everything. So um, just keep it minimal, no jewelry, no nothing thing, keep it simple. And the nurses will help you if something becomes untied or um, you're showing something that uh, or something's out that shouldn't be. 
And then uh, just probably uh, get the pertinent things out uh, quickly. And I, I do some of the things there. And I do tend myself to stay on the unit uh, for a little longer, just so you're available to the nurses, um, if, should there be any issues that come up. And then after a little while, I usually probably wander back to my office about 11 to 2, or 1 to 2, to get all the notes and, uh, and we call the families and all these sorts of things uh, done. And then after that, I go back to do kind of afternoon rounds to see uh, the patients that I think should be rounded on again. And uh, if there's new developments, obviously, you're running back to the ward anyway. Um, and then after that, take care of everything, and then you can leave again. And then we usually give handover to the uh, clinical assistants. Sorry, uh, Fraulein had correct me. They're not clinical associates, they're clinical assistants. So we usually give handover to them or whoever's um, covering the wards after about 5.30. Thanks. Nisha, um, what does your day on the COVID unit look like? Sorry, uh, so similar. Um, we, uh, because we're um, all unit based, we have in the morning we get handover from uh, the various teams that are giving us um, patients. We're, we are not physically going to handovers, or we're staying on our units and getting calls from the admitting team. Um, typically, uh, kind of early in the in the pandemic, we were able to kind of see our patients, and you were usually done by about noon, and we would go to our office and then, or um, uh, to the lounge or whatever. Uh, lately, though, it seems like we're basically on the unit the entire day. Um, patients are uh, de deteriorating all day, and the discharges also take a long time, so we're often just staying on the ward the whole time. Um, our labs, it doesn't sound like our labs are necessarily as coordinated as, as yours there. So labs come at all different times of the day, um, sometimes 10.30 or 11. Um, so we're often double rounding on these patients. And I think that's probably two reasons. One is um, uh, just lab staffing. But second, I think they were initially trying to prioritize all other units first and then come to the COVID wards. Um, it's a, I think probably at this point, given the number of wards we have, that's no longer going to be something that we can sustain. Um, because we do have some patients on our cardiac monitor, we are traveling between wards, so we are not wearing the same gown or anything when we're moving between wards. Um, and then in terms of uh, the ER, so Typically, our ER consult team is doing all the admissions. Um, we're not going down to do the admissions. However, if we do accept a direct admission, uh, which is not often, but if we accept a direct admission to the COVID ward, then we're not having the ER consult team come up. Then we are just taking care of the admission when they come to our ward. Um, and there is a question, and Wendy, I'll ask you this. Um, do, you, do you change your clothes? Uh, do you isolate from your family? Do you do anything special the week you're on uh, COVID ICU? Um, it's a good question. I, I definitely don't isolate from my family. I think if I couldn't go home and kiss and hug my kids, I would uh, have a much harder time coming to work every day. Um, I do wear my clothes from home to the hospital. I change into scrubs in my office here. Uh, and then I wear scrubs throughout the day. And then I change back into my clothes uh, to go home. And then depending on my day, to be honest, uh, sometimes I will have a shower if I have been intubating a whole bunch of patients and didn't always have a cap on my head. But again, I don't, I would say I shower maybe every three days, like every third, uh, in, on top of my usual showering per day, but I, I will shower. <laughs> I will shower maybe every two or three days uh, when I get home as a, as a separate sort of precaution, but I don't think that's necessary. Honestly, I think, um, I think our PPE protects us and I don't have concerns. I think my kids are more likely to get COVID from all the things. I mean, now obviously the things shut down, but my kids were playing hockey and playing soccer up until um, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, no, I have no concerns and I do not self-isolate from my family. Katie, do you want to add to any of what's been said? No, I think that's good. <laughs> um, I don't I self isolate either when I'm on. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have to say, no, I don't self-isolate. I agree with Wendy. I think that, that, you know, you need to have that time with your family. You need that time to decompress. Um, I personally like having scrubs on, um, you know, Shannon and I have this, this little debate about, about that. I, I feel comfortable in scrubs. Um, it is lighter uh, clothing and that way I don't have to worry about doing laundry and dry cleaning as much. I did end up showering when I got home, but that's because I was getting home so late. So um, I think it's, it's variable. Um, there 
there is some evidence, Stephanie, um, if I'm not mistaken, about shoes, though, right? That there, you know, shoes might be a potential uh, vector for carrying around COVID. Uh, I don't know if I would say that shoes in particular. I mean, I think that, you know, again, what we've seen, um, you know, in Edmonton and uh, from literature and other places is that, um, you know, COVID wards do get fairly heavily contaminated. So are your shoes going to get contaminated potentially? Is that actually viable virus? We don't really know. Um, so, you know, I think that um, it's reasonable to clean your hands before you take off your shoes. Um, but the reality is that the virus is not gonna live for long periods of time on your shoes. So I don't think that that's actually a really big uh, vector for transmission. Um, I do think that, you know, there is, there is some fomite transmission of COVID, but I think that it has to be fairly, I mean, I think it basically has to go kind of from patient to whatever, you know, to bed rail to, um, to the healthcare worker uh, in fairly quick succession. Um, because again, as I said, we can pick up uh, our TPCR in lots of environmental samples, but we have a hard time growing it. So again, I think the viability of the virus is not particularly long. So, you know, things like shoes and that kind of thing, I think, you know, if, as long as you're washing your hands when you take them off, I think by the next day, there's probably very uh, unlikely to be a viable virus when you're putting them back on. That's very reassuring. Um, so the next questions are around nighttime coverage on the COVID unit. So I'll start with the university site. So Katie, do you want to just share what we're doing at the university site currently? And then I can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so um, as Shannon mentioned uh, during the presentation, it is still in quite a bit of flux as to um, what type of coverage we have at night. I was just having a quick look through the chat and it looked like there was quite a few questions about um, resident coverage overnight. And so far, um, we don't have any resident coverage, um, at least at the university, um, for overnight, although that will be changing um, with the ARP having the GIM um, uh, some specialty residents actually covering some shifts. So essentially at 5.30, um, we would uh, give a call to the clinical assistant who's covering um, the ward and provide handover um, to them. And, you know, like Shanna mentioned, we will be called a lot overnight. Um, and certainly I was um, about the patients that are deteriorating. Um, I know there's been several staff that have also had to come back into hospital, especially in the late evening. Um, to care for patients who are um, deteriorating. Um, recently, uh, Dr. Morales has been arranging for um, an overnight ARP, which would be in the same time frame, so 5.30 to um, 8 a.m. And this has been staffed by, um, so far, I think a few of the internists, family physicians, I think a few eMERGE physicians have also um, signed up for this, as well as the GIM subspecialty residents. So um, that'll be another um, layer and someone to actually help us in covering the patients um, overnight. But given that we are, um, the MRP, um, ultimately it is, it is our responsibility to um, be available um, essentially at all times for these patients. Yeah, so I'll just um, add to that. So that, that is the whole purpose of the nighttime pandemic ARP coverage is to try and protect the daytime MRPs. Currently with the clinical assistants, you have to remember the clinical assistants are extremely junior. Um, so they're really providing sort of that um, at the at, you know, immediate um, coverage. Um, and that's why the daytime MRP historically has had to be available. So the, the way we had it was there is a general internal medicine CA that was covering the unit 5D4. And again, donning and do doffing takes a lot of time. So to expect a CA to cover more than one unit is not reasonable. This past weekend, I was covering a unit and a half. And what was exhausting was donning and doffing. That was the tough part, sort of going between units and so on. Um, so we have one CA per unit. So um, the GIM CA covers 5D4. We have a family medicine. CA that is currently covering um, 5F3, which is the shared unit between pulmonary medicine and family medicine. Once we opened 5D3, um, we felt that it was important to have additional help, and that's when uh, Dr. Morales uh, initiated the nocturnal pandemic ARP. So the nocturnal pandemic ARP is um, for uh, a, an MRP 
P-level physician. And uh, what we managed to do in the past two weeks is we have actually um, expedited licenses for our fifth year residents that have completed their internal medicine exams and are able to be licensed in core internal medicine. So the internal medicine specialty, um, obviously they're not subspecialty licensed yet. And we have expedited temporary privileges for them so that they can be um, paid on the pandemic ARP rate. Um, the, that rate is, is uh, remunerates at a higher level than the physician extender rate, which uh, frankly was not open to us because there just isn't funding for the physician extender, um, for additional physician extenders. So the, the pandemic ARP rate applies to R5s that are licensed, other MRPs, whether they're um, within the Department of Medicine or outside the Department of Medicine. So as um, Katie mentioned, we've asked um, emergency room physicians and um, surgeons uh, that may have a little bit of capacity if they're not covering ICU currently to help out. We've also asked uh, community physicians, so hospitalists, individuals that would normally cover, you know, uh, uh, this. that's what we mean by clinical associate. A clinical associate is someone who is licensed um, and can uh, provide MRP type coverage. If we have somebody who is at that MRP level in at site, then the daytime MRP doesn't have to be called because they can actually cover for those urgent issues. And that'll give the daytime MRPs that much needed rest that you need. Because um, right now, you know, we've got uh, fresh, enthusiastic uh, uh, physicians like uh, Katie, Nija, and Shannon that are, are doing multiple uh, weeks on the ward wards, but they are going to get tired. And certainly, you know, as we bring more people on, we know that, you know, being on for a number of days, it's exhausting if you can't get that little bit of rest at night. So if we have an in-house coverage MRP through the pandemic ARP, that will give us that much needed rest. Currently, um, as we're just preparing to open our fourth unit as a full unit, it's currently a mixed unit, the 5D2 unit, um, that it's, it's absolutely essential that we have that call list covered. So um, after uh, some time today, I am going to be reaching out to the entire department across the entire zone to sign up for additional shifts to help each other out, because that's how we're going to get through this next few months is if we help each other out. So I'm hoping that, you know, I know many of you are already signed up for your primary service, backup service, and then the COVID roster. But if you have any additional capacity, um, if you could please help us out and sign up. And this is for site wide, um, zone wide, not just our site, because obviously um, the Royal Alec um, needs help as well as the Grey Nuns, the Misericordia and, uh, and the Sturgeon. They've got far, far fewer um, attendings at those sites than we do at the, the university. We're actually very fortunate that we do have a larger department of medicine and, and all the our section chiefs and division directors, um, including cardiology and neurology, have all just, you know, sort of done whatever we need to do to, to get everybody um, going and working. Um, you know, this is the, these are unprecedented times, right? And um, what what do we want to be able to say next year when this is all behind us? We want to say that that our department stepped up, our site, our zone um, stepped up when we needed it, and so that's why we are asking that um, people step up and and um, and make themselves available. Um, just in recognition of the fact that we are, a, a number of us are on the AMHSP, we have also made special arrangements for AMHSP physicians that are doing extra coverage at night and on weekends to get extra remuneration. And so I've shared that with your division directors and your section chiefs, um, speak to them, but um, otherwise just reach out to me if you're not sure about that and I can, I can clarify the, the details of that. Nisha, do you wanna talk about your nighttime coverage and what's happening? Uh, sure. So very similar. Um, we are um, currently, we have uh, the GIM subspecialty fellows helping us out at night. Uh, if we don't have somebody available for the night, then we are um, utilizing our CAs and we probably are at a point where we will have to pull a uh, daytime CA uh, to help with nighttime coverage. Uh, if we don't get every night filled, we are looking at some other models. Uh, we do have some medicine nurse practitioners, but it's not a large number. So I don't think that's a 
overall sustainable model. Um, we will be reaching out to the subspecials at our sites and, and Emerge Dogs to see if anybody's interested in doing the pandemic MRP overnight. Um, but again, I think it's it's much like the other sites. I think we're kind of piecemealing it together night by night to make sure that we have somebody. Uh, and as we get more teams, we will just continue to pull from daytime coverage CAs to help us cover at night. And yes, there are call rooms available. Um, and I, I guess the other question that I should just, since we have a little bit of time, is I was going to actually put Rashmi Karana on the spot if she's available, because there are some questions. I know we've got audiences from other sites as well. We don't see pregnant patients in, in at the university, although we did admit a pregnant patient this past weekend. Um, so I'm going to, uh, Rashmi, put you in as a panelist. And if you want to comment on the issue around uh, pregnant patients and acute COVID infection. Okay, thanks, uh, Norman. So um, for the pregnant patients, I think uh, some of the key things to remember is that, well, I think this one thing we have to differentiate is, is the patient there for an obstetric issue or there for COVID. And fortunately, unlike H1N1, uh, our pregnant patients, for the large part, have not been necessarily been in the very, very sick um, uh, category. So there is some evidence that there may be increases in preterm birth and um, that there might be increased hospitalization and ICU admission. Um, and especially for women who are in their third trimester, they're already working to, into their physiologic reserve and that might be part of the reasons for it. There may be also slightly lower thresholds for admitting patients to those units. So uh, you know, I think we'll have to sort that over time. Um, given that we have limited treatments for um, COVID in general, it makes it in pregnancy not that difficult. So a few differences that I've noted, and I have to say, I haven't had a lot of experience looking after these patients. There's been the, a few that have been admitted to the ALEC. Uh, I don't know, Nita might be able to know if they've, any of have gone to the ICU. Um, so one thing is that we usually try to keep the oxygen saturation above 94% for fetal reasons. Um, the second thing is, is dexamethasone is a steroid that crosses the placenta very well. It's one of the alternative steroids that can be given for fetal lung maturity. So um, many people have suggested that we use equivalent doses of steroids, uh, different steroids such as hydrocortisone or the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They suggest uh, prednisolone. I don't think we have as much access. So you could use prednisone and the equivalent dose is about 50 milligrams of prednisone instead of dexamethasone. Um, and then uh, don't forget the, your uh, VTE prophylaxis. Uh, I think, um, and, and in pregnancy, they tend to have increased volume of distribution and um, um, they um, may metabolize things faster. So uh, we've been sort of aiming on the higher end for the VT prophylaxis. So for tens of parent, actually calculating out the 75 units per um, kilogram and rounding up. Um, and we've, I've had a number of outpatients that have gone to the emergency room with COVID symptoms and uh, they've had um, CTPEs, finding small segmental clots. And uh, so I think, um, if we look for it, we're, we're seeing a lot of thrombosis in that population. Um, I think the difficult part is those patients who have a viable pregnancy and where to manage those. And uh, I think at the ALEC, um, the pre-viable are going to the COVID wards and then the viable patients, depending on what they're there for, are going different places. It's, it's a tricky situation. I don't know what the right answer is. I have some concern about all these COVID patients on the part of ward, you know, on the other side of the hallway from the non-COVID patients, as well as a lack of um, the, the PPE coaches uh, uh, at those sites. Um, I, I don't know what the right answer is for that. Uh, Rashmi, I'll maybe expand on that a little bit too. We, uh, early in the pandemic plan, we had talked to our OMSGAIN colleague, 
And I think the plan was, as you said, um, if, if viable, they were staying actually on um, our Robbins area under Alpskine. Um, and that's really what, actually what has happened in practice. We've, we've had probably about six or seven kind of early first trimester uh, pregnant women come to our unit. And usually it's, it's because they still need to be, we, we're treating them just like any other patient, like they still need to be in hospital for a respiratory or uh, nausea, vomiting. Um, but the other thing that we have started doing now, um, particularly as we've had more and more COVID show up on non-medicine services, so sur gen surge, uh, ortho, um, uh, plastic surgery, is that if the if the primary condition of the patient, so if it's surgery related um, or pregnancy, is still quite active, um, they may come to the COVID ward, but they stay under uh, gen surge, for example. Um, then GIM, whoever is on the COVID ward, will consult for the COVID piece of it. Um, this is fairly new that we've been doing kind of the last week or so, uh, just because, I, you know, at some point, I don't think GIM and, and uh, family medicine take every single COVID patient that comes in. Um, so if they are going back and forth to the OR every day, uh, they will be on the COVID ward and they'll stay under uh, gen surge and then we will consult. So that's something we're also working on. So we're doing that as well with our OBSGYN population is that if they are concerned, and typically we haven't had any really sick uh, pregnant ladies, but if they are concerned, they will call typically I think OBSMED first or they'll call the COVID doc. Thank you. Um, I know there was a question about um, transferring patients, pregnant patients to the Royal Alec. I can tell you that um, this weekend we just spoke to the patient's OBGYN and the patient was very early on and we kept them actually on our, um, at our site because I can see the, um, the other sites getting overwhelmed if we, if we start sending anyone, who, everyone that doesn't need to go there, um, but definitely get in touch with their OBGYN. Um, I'm going to ask Wendy, since we have a little bit of time, to comment on any treatment updates. Um, you know, uh, Katie obviously touched on remdesivir, but is there anything else that you can provide in terms of updates with regards to treatment? Carmen, yeah, no, I would, I would uh, just reiterate that uh, that uh, steroids are really the uh, standard of care for any patients that are on oxygen. Um, there, are, there was a question in the chat about a reduction of immune suppression. Uh, and so I did answer that in the chat if you have time to read that. But in particular, I think you need to ask yourself why the patient's immune suppressed. So if they're a transplant patient um, and obviously holding or reducing their immune suppression puts them at risk of graft loss, we're generally not suggesting uh, a reduction in immune suppression. I guess if you can hold immune suppression, um, you can consider that, but there's really no data. And, and I would resume immune suppression as soon as the patient's clinically improved. There was another question, uh, Raj had asked a question about monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and we have received a large, we've received about 2,300 vials of bamlanivimab, which is a monoclonal antibody. The Provincial Antiviral Working Group is currently reviewing the data uh, evidence for use of this drug. It tends to be, it's a drug for outpatient use to prevent the progression of disease in those that have mild disease, to prevent them from progressing to severe disease uh, in those that have risk factors. But obviously there's logistical challenges about how we would administer an outpatient drug. It's a prolonged infusion. Um, and so that is not recommended currently in hospitalized patients in terms of remdesivir, um, you know, there is some data that perhaps it decreases the uh, duration of clinical symptoms. I would still strongly suggest you consider enrolling patients in CATCO because we don't know which patients. Uh, we think it may have some benefit in the low flow oxygen uh, group of patients, but we need more data. So again, please consider uh, asking your patients if they would be interested in research trials and we would be happy to talk to them about CATCO. We also still have CONCOR1 running. That's our convalescent plasma trial. Um, there has been some data. Um, there's been a lot of data actually, but again, no definitive answer on whether or not convalescent plasma improves outcomes. So we still are actively enrolling to that trial and we hope to have a new interventional trial looking at um, total like receptor 4 inhibition. So some newer therapies that will be uh, available uh, over time. So again, standard of care, dexamethasone or another steroid, again, if you have a pregnant patient, uh, in any patient that is hospitalized with COVID on oxygen, and then uh, things are changing very rapidly, and we'll update you as more information becomes available. 
Thanks, Wendy. Um, there's a few questions around CMPA and CPSA. All I'm going to say about that is, number one, that there are some very good guidelines, both on the CMPA website as well as the CPSA website. Keep in mind that if you um, have core internal medicine training, that you are um, uh, still, you're licensed as an internist, which means that you can provide inpatient care. Um, some of you may have seen the document that we've put forward in terms of level two uh, practitioners, which is basically all um, internal medicine practitioners that have, uh, that do currently practice inpatient medicine. And then there's the level three. So we've, we've been very cognizant of identifying sort of where we, we um, um, mobilize which level Levels. And even in, in the level three, um, there are at least half of those practitioners that do have core internal medicine training. And so you are you are licensed in that area. But I, I'll post more, more information on that on our website. Um, I, I also am going to put one more person on the spot here if she's still on, and that is Robin Harrison. Robin, there's been a lot of questions around um, around uh, uh, the, the issue of um, of healthcare worker um, infections and and safety and and so on. Um, I'm hoping I put I gave you speaking privileges here. Um, do you have any comments with regards to that? Um, and uh, and and anything further to add from anything that we've already said? Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, I've joined on a phone, so it's a different platform for me. But um, I uh, so I guess the only message I would have is that when we set up the healthcare worker testing dashboard um, uh, back in March, um, one of the reasons was so that we knew where the areas of risk were or were not and whether our measures work. And so I guess I would just reiterate that um, all of the great work that has been described here on your wards is what's gonna protect you. And we are seeing through that dashboard that the personal protective equipment, when people are careful with the doffing, um, uh, is protecting our workers um, through multiple, multiple you know, patient care hours. Um, these things work so that people can feel confident uh, coming to work, but you've got to stay mindful, attentive, and um, and um, the the greatest areas of risk still are outside of work in the community or when you're caring for patients and didn't um, think about um, COVID or there was something unusual about the case. And so the other layers of prevention, like remaining distanced when you take a history when you're able to, or um, uh, being extra diligent with your hand washing and the masking, um, those are the things that catch you and prevent infection in those moments. So I hope that answers your question, but I, I think in these, um, in these wards that are uh, planned, organized with all the great people working there that you've described, all of the, the great morale and the officers, um, those things really do work. And, um, and uh, we're seeing that through the testing dashboard to sort of put some um, evidence behind it. Thank you, Robin. I think that's really reassuring. Um, okay, so I uh, see there's still a, over 180 people still signed in. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that there's so much interest in this. This will all get posted. We've got the permission from all the speakers to um, have recorded this and we will be posting that. We will summarize all the questions that have been asked um, and the answers, some of them were typed in, some of them were answered live. Um, again, if you have questions, uh, I'm sure any one of the speakers would be happy to answer them. Otherwise, if you direct them to me, I'll make sure that they're answered in a timely manner. Um, and before we go, I'm just going to ask everyone just to, to give us a little, you know, sort of uh, final words, I guess. So, Wendy, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I'll make it quick. I think in terms of ICU involvement, we are here to help you. If you uh, are concerned, you're worried, pick up the phone, call us. We're always around. Uh, I want you guys all to feel very supported. So that is my bottom line from ICU. Thank you. Nisha? Um, yeah, I would just say that working on the ward, you know, if we look at it as working on any other inpatient ward, just taking it patient by patient and making sure that you're protected with your PPE. And that if you're a subspecialist working, at least at the Alex, we'll make sure that you're buddied up with a GIM doc so that you have some support. And Katie. Yeah, just thanks so much, um, Norman, for inviting us all to speak today. Um, I think, yeah, I'm learning so much every day being on the COVID unit. And so hopefully we can all continue to work together and 
um, really make a good impact on these patients. Yeah. And for those of you that are tuned in and are getting ready to go on the COVID ward next, please know that we do have a plan in place to buddy up for um, at this site as well. Um, so currently nephrology is uh, getting supported with GIM and the plan is to have another GIM service um, on with nephrology. The next, uh, as uh, Shannon showed, is geriatrics and, and GI and we have a plan for pulmonary to support and there's multiple levels of support. There's shadowing, there is a buddy system, um, there is a WhatsApp group, there are Connect Care um, referrals uh, and capability. Um, and so there's lots and lots, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that you're well aware of that um, before you go on service. Um, and, uh, and we're here to support. So let's just all, you know, sort of pitch in, um, help each other out, be kind, and, um, and thank you everybody for everything you're doing. Take care. Mm -hmm.